It looks like attendees are joining us, so I will begin in just a moment. <clears throat> okay, well, it looks like attendees have begun filtering in, so I will uh, get us started. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our colloquium meeting for this Friday, March 25th. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Badesky, who will be speaking to us today. Dr. Badesky is an emeritus professor at the University of Victoria in Canada. Um, he also previously taught at Ohio State University as well as Carleton University, and he maintains a, a status as affiliate professor at the Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington. He is also the president of the Asian Politics and History Association, and he holds an honorary doctorate from the Mongolia Academy of Science uh, and has received the Mongolia's Presidential Medal. Uh, he has published recent books in 2018, Prolonging Existence, Lessons from Genghis Khan and a Theory of Life Security. And in 2021, Dynamics of the Korean State, from the Paleolithic to Candlelight Democracy. And today he is going to be presenting a talk called Fading Solitudes, America and China as Rival States, Economic Partners, and Alternative Civilizations. So uh, Dr. Badesky is going to give his talk, uh, during which if you have any questions, please feel free to post them on the Q&A. Once Dr. Badesky has finished his presentation, um, I will uh, read out some questions for, for him to answer. So with that, why don't we get started? Thank you, Dr. Badesky, for joining us, and please take it away. Well, good afternoon, everybody. and. Um... I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Hinojosa, the director of the School of Politics and Global Studies at Arizona State University, and appreciation to Matthew Oxford and Professor Timothy Peterson for setting this up today. My presentation today consists of three parts, but uh, let me first look at the, um, uh, the, the underlying theme will be that uh, something Confucius had said, there can not be two suns in the sky, nor two emperors on the earth. It's all about uh, global governance. My presentation today consists of three parts. First is the current situation with emphasis on the US, China, and Russia, and whether we're seeing a resurrection of the Sino-Russian bloc and a new Cold War. Secondly, I will consider the current conflict as a possible clash of civilizations with the caveat that while informative as a framework of analysis, the notion <clears throat> of a civilization uh, fails to capture the full magnitude of the current era with the rise of the modern sovereign nation state as a supreme entity that transcends and manages civilizations. Third, in order to understand the distinction between civilization and state, I present an abbreviated theory of the state which I developed in an examination of Korean history and based on six types of action. It is a framework with application to many, if not most states. First, I wanna talk about the current global shift. 141 governments in the United Nations voted against the war in the Ukraine. The February 24th Russian invasion has been condemned as aggression against a sovereign state and sanctions have been imposed to counter and punish Putin and the Russian government. Some speak of a new Cold War, and experts are watching China's behavior as supportive of Russia by non-compliance with sanctions and continued purchase of energy. A development with significance transcending the incident itself, it may lead to reframing the international structure of power, which heretofore has seen the US as the dominant world power. So far, China has been a silent beneficiary of Russian aggression, not in terms of actual gains, but in distracting focus on her own rise in power and a test of Western response to aggression. It is a test of NATO resolve in the face of a severe military challenge. Had NATO shrunk from pushing back, it would have given China an opening to take a more active and belligerent attitude on Taiwan. This response should caution China in any potential aggressive actions. 
From a Chinese perspective, Putin's move to reinstall Russian power over Ukraine has rough analogy with China's goal to reunite with Taiwan. Both are irredenta, notable for their strategic importance, and both have political, cultural, and linguistic differences with the claiming state as well, as sizable minorities and bloodline links to China and Russia. There are major differences as well. Ukraine is contiguous with Russia, while Taiwan is separated from China by the moat-like Strait of Taiwan. The People's Republic of China has never controlled Taiwan, whereas Ukraine was part of the Russian and Soviet empires for decades. Russian control of the north coast of the Black Sea is essential for future projection of power into and across the Black Sea. Chinese control of Taiwan would not only impose a communist dictatorship over the democratic island, but would also turn the Taiwan Strait into Chinese territorial waters. China's naval buildup and island claims in the South China Seas indicate an ambitious maritime agenda. The extension of Chinese port management and infrastructure development in Africa indicate a strategic plan of growing economic presence followed by political influence in countries which have enjoyed fewer benefits from globalization's progress. Chinese companies have been buying American farmland as well. There is simultaneously increasing Chinese presence in the Arctic in the search for resources. In 2011, President Obama announced the American pivot to Asia in response to China's rise and the concern that dependence on vital materials from China was increasing. President Trump tried to work with the Chinese Communist Party, Secretary General Xi Jinping, hoping that China would, uh, would pressure South, or excuse me, North Korea to halt weapons testing and bellicosity. The arrival of COVID from Wuhan was a signal that China's cooperation in vital areas cannot be re relied upon. Now the current Amer American administration may see the world returning to the bad old days of the Cold War. How we will handle growing suspicion and animosity from and to Russia and China will be a major challenge for the US, distracting from domestic challenges of, of inflation and border control. The Chinese leadership is watching the West's response to Russia for indications of how the Quad powers, that is the US, Australia, Japan, and India, might respond to any move to retake Taiwan. NATO and America's relatively united response to Ukraine has been an unpleasant surprise to Putin and Xi Jinping, who possibly calculated that what the West is a declining civilization and might be slow to stand up to aggression. However, this robust response has also driven Russia into greater dependence on China. Xi Jinping's Belt Road and purchase of Siberian energy will strengthen Sino-Russian ties. As the two Eurasian powers draw closer together and possibly form an informal new bloc, China will be the senior partner, an inversion of the Stalin-Mao alliance of the past. <clears throat> At the same time, European NATO countries have increasing reservations about the long-term reliability of American leadership and are realizing the pitfalls of dependence on Russian and green energy. A new great game echoing British-Russian maneuvering of the 19th century is coincidentally pivoting around Afghanistan, as did the old great game, an intense rivalry between the British and Russian empires in Central Asia. American withdrawal from the country signaled failure to democratize this geopolitical pivot. To enemies and rivals, it indicated a loss of confidence, as had been the withdrawal of Soviet forces in 1988-1989. Putin, having a war chest fattened by energy sales, fearing detachment of Ukraine from Russian influence, and perhaps judging that American decline was likely, launched a blitzkrieg on the recalcitrant border nation. Like Dostoevsky, Putin is a gambler, but with much higher stakes. Where Europeans had been the key players in the 19th century, now China and Russia have the stronger hand in the game. Iran is also intent on extracting concessions from the great Satan. European NATO countries have awakened to the dangers posed by economic dependence on Russia and China, while anxious over American intentions and will. We're at a turning point in world political configurations and Sino-American relations will be a major factor in the future. To better understand China's 
increasing role in the world, uh, in the world of politics, I'll next address the fundamentals of Sino-American relations. Cold War I was characterized by ideological confrontation, local proxy wars, market versus planned economies, and centralized authoritarianism versus democratic republics. The rivalries uh, spurred military and scientific innovation, culminating in the space race. The US and the USSR competed for global, uh, global hegemony, and the losing side underwent a new time of troubles as former Soviet republics navigated their new circumstances of national independence. Cold War II will, will also be a confrontation of states, likely China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran on one side having or aspiring to possession of nuclear weapons. In the longer term, it will be interstate competition and conflict and somewhat less of what Huntington called clash of civilizations. Civil, civilizations in conflict is hardly a new phenomenon in world history, but wars between states have been most dem devastating. Toynbee equated civilization with society, including various groups and a special attention to the proletariat and creative elites. Emile Durkheim, the French uh, uh, sociologist, would include the foundation in the division of labor and Marx, the inequality and conflict between classes. Society consists of individuals, families, tribes, and assorted groups in cooperation and competition, linked in the economy, culture, and religion. The state builds on a foundation of civilization and draws upon its resources to enhance security of the population <clears throat> within a given territory. Civilizations rarely have the cohesion necessary to go to war, and so states are organized to remedy weak protection of societies. America and China represent two distinctive civilizations. The US was founded on principles and designs of the Hellenistic tradition, starting from Greece and Rome, refined in medieval Christianity and drawing ideas from the Renaissance and enlightenment. In the age of industrial imperialism, America was a partner of Western European expansionism, as well as in democracy. A key principle has been that state power emanates from society and that all people have inalienable rights Citizen participation in government began with the Greeks and Roman government demonstrated the indispensability of compliance to rule of law. Western theories of government assume that political order results in a balance of power between government and society, where there is equality under law and liberty of person and property. Although far from perfect, it is a system embedded in Western civilization and its various states. Chinese civilization began thousands of years ago and has undergone periods of unity and disunity. A unique, a unique civilization evolved with its own writing system, attitudes to law and family, and presently shares borders with 14 countries. The Chinese word for state is guojia, literally meaning state, family. And for civilization, it is wenming or culture enlightenment. Unlike the West's emphasis on the individual person, Chinese traditional civilization stressed the human collectivity. Selfhood is subordinate to group identity and privacy is less valued. Learning and education have high value for the person. <clears throat> Order is imposed from above and results from acceptance of obligations and conformity. Equality under law is not a right, but the result of just laws, a compliant population and enforcement by government. Uh, those are the characters that I was referring to. Arnold Toynbee's notion of civilization was synonymous with society, with government as manager and defender of society, with specialized functions and standing military forces. A conceptual innovation occurred with the formulation or the formation of the Prussia state and Hegel's formulation of the state as part of the divine plan for human history. Thus began the notion of an all powerful entity, stronger than organic society and a separate realm of human existence. Machiavelli conceived of the state as a work of art, the creation of men not beholden to church and religion. Nietzsche lauded the Ubermensch or Superman who valorized the will to power. In other words, the state came to transcend society 
and civilization bending to human design and human will. Woodrow Wilson wrote that all government rests on force and Max Weber defined the state as the body um, having a monopoly of force. The state supersedes society and civilization. Great dynasties unify the Chinese state since the third century BC, followed by decline and fragmentation. Growth of the unified state oversaw the evolution of Chinese civilization throughout history. State unity has been the goal of wars and political maneuvering for the purpose of creating orderly relations and prosperity. A long period of warring states of the Zhang Guo Shidai, 475 to 221 BC, preceded unification under the short life Cho, uh, Qing dynasty, a Qin dynasty, which lasted 221 to 206 BC. In the 20th century AD, a period of warlords and foreign interventions preceded unification under the communists. The Guomindang party under Zhang Kai-shek paved the way for post-war unity and might have completed the task had not the Japanese invaded. Historically, unity has been achieved largely through military conquest requiring manpower, weapons, and strategy. After 1949, traditional Chinese civilization became the target of the communist state. Land tenure and traditional marriage were the first objects of legislation from the National People's Congress. A series of party-led mass movements attacked corruption, bourgeois and traditional customs, passivity, and other burdens of the past, culminating in the great proletarian cultural revolution. Much damage was done. Tens of millions died in the famines and millions more fled to Hong Kong, Taiwan, and beyond. In the end, Chinese civilization was purged of many traditional elements, as well as many potential dissidents. <clears throat> the party rehabilitated Deng Xiaoping and he supervised the reforms after Mao's death, indicating a new party line, stressing orderly and rapid modernization. His oft-quoted, seek truth from facts, signaled pragmatism and non-ideological approach to reform valuing results over dogma. The repression of demonstrations in Tiananmen Square in June of 1989 proved that liberal democracy was not one of his goals. After Mao's death, September 1976, a central priority was to replace rule of man with rule of law. The apotheosis of Mao's cult of revolution did great damage to China's society and economy. Deng installed a regime of legality with legislation and establishment of law schools. The state's foundation in law was vital in establishing joint ventures with foreign companies, a move to accelerate acquisition of foreign technology. State, pow state power has been regularized and the Communist Party with 6.7% of the population has control over all aspects of society. Consistent through more than two millennia of history has been the top-down control of society by an elite under a powerful ruler, whether king, emperor, president, or party chairman. Turning to the American state, in contrast to China, design of the American state emphasized divided power of government in order to uh, maintain restrain, restraints against tyranny. Elections represent popular sovereignty. Courts interpret and judge new laws based on the constitution. States exercise powers not delegated to the federal government and the Congress makes laws that must conform to the constitution. Shifting attitudes since the 1960s I've seen growth of the imperial presidency with power shifting to the executive branch and its burgeoning bureaucracy at the expense of congressional oversight. Also courts have become more politicized with more injection of partisanship in the nominating and approval process. In addition, a combination of radicalism and civil rights has raised questions about the justice and legitimacy of existing laws and institutions challenging past dedication to rule of law as it was practiced. The two nations have become economic partners over the past half century, but stresses in this relationship are increasing and are leading to economic and political tensions. Unless there is settlement of the Ukraine battle, Sino-American relations are bound to worsen as China is pressured to support its continental neighbor at the expense of its oceanic partner. Some of these, the uh, stress points include, first, the military. China has rapidly advanced as maritime, air, and space capabilities have grown. 
as well as in cyber war and artificial intelligence. Test of hypersonic missile of, of a hypersonic missile demonstrated a possible first strike capability. The US currently has 3,750 uh, 3, nuclear warheads in its stockpile, dwarfing the number of China's nuclear warheads. But China's new delivery system may neutralize that advantage. Second is the rule of law. No country can survive or prosper without an enforced system of laws. The American legal system prides itself for protection of individuals, and by extension, property and corporations. Chinese law tends to favor the state's stability and primacy at the expense of individual privacy and autonomy. The, the uh, National Intelligence Law of 2017 can require Chinese businesses and citizens to turn over data and other information to government intelligence, intelligence agencies, even if they are located abroad. This makes every Chinese citizen a potential espionage agent. As government agencies are increasingly shareholders in businesses, they will have direct access to data. Third is culture. The Chinese Communist Party promotes a homogeneous society infused with nationalism based on continuous economic achievement. Maoists tried to transform agrarian China into a revolutionary society organized into communes and work units at the expense of family and traditional society. Under the post-Mao reforms, the family has been reinstated as one of several groups underpinning society. American culture expressed in law, family, and entertainment has drifted from family and religion to greater emphasis on the individual racial or sexual identity. <clears throat> a fourth stress point is the economy. Both countries have embraced the digital revolution with benefits in providing greater control and surveillance over citizens, their movements, habits, and holdings. China's individuals have fewer legal rights as the party government exerts major control over the internet and social media. American social media show signs of censorship over some persuasions and people, but remain mostly open. In terms of production and distribution, with China's 1.4 billion population, adequate food, energy, and resources will always be a source of anxiety. It was a concern that underlay the frenzied Great Leap Forward with the introduction of damaging farming practices. Subsequently, me uh, mechanism or mechanization and greater use of chemical pesticides and fertilizers have boosted food production. Industrial production geared to international markets has earned much foreign currency. The country has made no secret of the intention to replace the US dollar as the global reserve currency. When the major credit card companies excluded Russia from their system over the Ukraine, China quickly opened its own banking system uh, access to Russia. The fifth area of stress is politics. When serious modernization and reforms began in the late 1970s, China seemed on a trajectory to democracy. The 1989 student demonstrations and subsequent repression signaled the limits to political reform. While party controlled elections occur at the local level and hopes for greater openness are expressed, the reality is that the party retains and expands control of society. Liberty of individuals is neither a political nor cultural priority. America has become a multicultural nation of ethnic identities. From the Chinese perspective, we have increased our coin, which is inscribed e pluribus unum. Uh, um, we have uh, increased our pluribus, uh, pluribus at the expense of our unum. In addition, a significant segment of the younger electorate favors a movement <clears throat> towards socialism and away from capitalism. Conservatives and old liberals see socialism as requiring a stronger and more intrusive state apparatus to resemble China more than America of the past, a development that undercuts the idea of limited government. In some, old solitudes have been updated. China is no longer the exotic far east to Americans, and the US is no longer the epitome of wealth and power to the Chinese. On Sino-American relations, in the second part, I will address the relations between China and our country. With substantial differences in civilization and state and a history of love-hate dialectic, the two nations are bound to experience conflict and mutual suspicion. Their relative solitude has declined since the mid-19th century, 
Contacts began with trade, followed by missionaries who preached Christianity, built schools and hospitals, and sponsored students to study in the West. To Chinese communism, Americans were part of the foreign imperialists who came to exploit the country. Dynastic de decline and foreign aggression made the empire ripe for colonization as Russia and Japan vied for territory and concessions. American acquisition in 1898 of Hawaii and the Philippines created greater interest in and proximity to China, as well as having common cause with the other European empires. Entry into the anti-Japanese war in 1941 gave the US a much, much greater stake in China and the communist revolution of 1949 transformed the relationship into enmity, which intensified in the Korean War. A major pivot occurred when Nixon visited China in 1972 and sought to play the China card against the Soviet Union. Although it was more likely that China was playing the American card to offset the Soviet threat. It was not an alliance, but a confluence of interests serving both. After the death of Mao Zedong, pragmatist Deng Xiaoping launched a series of reforms termed the Four Modernizations to undo the damage inflicted by Mao's radical programs. Rule of law replaced rule by man. The People's Congress became more of a legislative branch and the Chinese Communist Party retained full power over the nation and government. Joint venture legislation facilitated foreign investment and thousands of students were sent abroad to acquire science and technology, knowledge and skills. The armed forces were modernized. Digital technology was incorporated and limited political reform was pursued. When the country was awarded membership in the WTO, the, tra the World Trade Organization, trade and investment with advanced industrial economies accelerated, expediting mod a rapid modernization in all fields and raising hope that China would evolve into a democratic polity. There was backlash in the US against offshoring many industries to a country with far few workers and environmental protections with lower uh, labor costs and transfer of, of advanced technology. President Trump president, uh, represented part of the reaction to trade deals, trade deals, but was characterized as anti-free trade when he instituted tariffs. <clears throat> American consumers have benefited from lower costs. Corporations have profited by relocating operations abroad and the glow of the post-Cold War dividend created an era of good feeling where Americans would enjoy peace and prosperity, letting the good times roll without end. One could argue that the world economy has become or is becoming a single globalized system and any major change may have negative effects, starting with interruptions and dislocations. The, the time frame of declining solitude between the US and China was around 170 years between first contacts and the present. From 1972 to the present, Sino-American relations have been relatively stable. China refuses to condemn Russia over the Ukraine operation. Threats to reunify with Taiwan and the military buildup declare a more proactive state. The country is a rising, uh, excuse me, rising economic power and has directed that prosperity into military modernization, among other things. It sees the hundred years before the communist revolution as a period of decline, poverty, and disunity. A ruthless leadership saw elimination of possible dissent through exile, dismissal, and punishment. Christians, Uyghurs, and Falun Gong are persecuted as potentially disloyal to the state. With a fairly unified society working for national purpose and showing conformity to the Communist Party with a compliant military, China has entered a new era of prosperity and confidence to enjoy a degree of national unity and patriotism, possibly unparalleled in history. In contrast, they see the US and Western civilization entering an, area of, uh, an era of fragmentation. Race theory emphasizes differences and drives a wedge between ethnic groups. Federalism is the opposite of centralization that characterizes other countries. Chinese state power is concentrated in the party in contrast to the American system of three co-equal branches. A single lang uh, national language, Chinese, is taught and used, unlike the multilingualism in this country. Laws and regulations slow new projects and make new infrastructure 
more expensive, unlike shorter timelines between plan, construction, and completion in China. The difference between the two nations is most glaring in the rule of law, an ancient legalist doctrine, but a relatively new concept in communist China. The US has moved away from strict rule of law to regulation by lawyers and bureaucrats with the help of lobbyists and the flexible living constitution theory. While American media speak with one voice, American freedom, uh, while well, Chinese media speak with one voice, American freedom of speech allows dissenting and even false information to circulate and create dissent. Pornography, drugs, and homelessness contribute no, an image of social decline. Schools fail to produce the needed STEM graduates, and government benefits provide disincentives to work. <clears throat> so, uh, the um, in sum, the Chinese or a Chinese perspective of America is one of social and political decline, while their own country has accomplished phenomenal progress for the benefit of the state and society. Western capitalism has produced inequality as Chinese socialism avoids economic and social differences. As to the long run prospects, Toynbee traced the effects of external proletariat and internal proletariat on a series of civilizations. Growing dissatisfaction among domestic workers over significant arrival and employment of external workers has been one source of division in America. As globalization of trade and investment has grown, a third proletariat has become a productive factor, the overseas pro uh, proletariat consisting of East and South Asian workers whose lower wages, minimal agitation for a union organization and work ethic have been attractive to investors. Another result has been to reduce investment and jobs in this country. Hotchman cites the solar industry as one example. Quote, from the 1950s to the 1980s, for example, the US controlled more than 90% of the solar market. But by the mid 2000s, we were producing a mere 9% of solar panels worldwide, having outsourced production of any number of clean energy technologies to China, end of quote. As a rough and ready definition of the state, the Chinese ideograph for state, Guo, contains three elements that indicate a state's essence, society, territory, and government with its military arm. Remove any of the three and it is no longer a state. Toynbee and other historians tend to fold in government as part of civilization, when in truth, the state is a separate entity and dictates a different, different existence to subjects and citizens. The ethics of the state differ in significant ways from those of society. Killing others is anathema in society, but it is a defensive necessity monopolized by the state. Confiscation of property is criminalized in society, but is a common practice in states. The American state began with the Declaration of Independence and her government has progressively acquired power since then. Today, there are a few areas where central government does not play a leading part. Science and technology, education, healthcare, infrastructure, or natural environment are all subject to secular government policy and direction. The acceleration of this development can be traced to Woodrow Wilson, whose progressivism portrayed the state as the most rational organizer of human society. Positive and negative aspects of the state are manifest. It has nurtured and uh, protected civilizations since ancient times, but it has also driven uh, genocide and aggression. The American state was founded on the principle of restricting government, while the Chinese state has long sought to concentrate all political power in government, whether dynastic or communist. In this respect, China and the US are polar opposites, despite the two societies having much in common, including the individual quest for longevity, health, prosperity, and meaning. Nuclear families working and striving for better lives for themselves and their children. In this third <clears throat> and final section, I address the concept of the state, often, uh, often offered as a synonym for country or nation or nation state. There's also the confusion of state as a subdivision of a country, which is more the American usage. A few years ago, when I was touring Rome, uh, our guide mentioned that the Vatican is a state and a nearby American tourist remarked that it cannot be a state because it has no representative 
in Congress. So there you see the two different meanings. It is vital that we understand the state's dynamics and how it frames conflicts and accommodations to changing circumstances. Perhaps we are standing at a crossroad in history and the future direction will be determined by adaptations, strategies and agendas of states, which are far more flexible than civilizations. States are the tectonic plates of human history and their sudden shifting can cause human earthquakes and tsunamis of war. The democratic persuasion is to treat the state as dependent upon society while authoritarians speak to empower the, seek to empower the state for the purpose of increasing control over society. In either case, the state is a completely human construction using and discarding available resources within a boundary territory. The state is the latest human arrangement to increase human life security. And what could be more human than what the philosopher Schopenhauer called the will to live? When Nietzsche declared the death of God, he shifted man's gaze from divine power to a completely human-centered world. It meant that godlike men would rule lesser men because of their will to power, rejecting Schopenhauer's primacy of the will to live. Both philosophers identified crucial elements of the state although they did not pursue the implications, that is the primacy of will and the essential role in state building. How do civilizations differ from the state? First, civilization is a society in historical context. A state consists of society, sovereign government, and territory, while civilization's government is largely limited to managerial and defense functions. Also, it is organic in the sense that it connects individuals and groups in a division of labor, and exhibits hierarchy of status to maintain separate segments of rulers and ruled. The purpose of the state is to defend the lives of its population. Society supports the state insofar as it provides life security for those who claim its protection. The power of the modern secular state has taken root in human consciousness and activity, providing security and accepting its sovereignty at the expense of religion and personal autonomy. In this sense, the state has replaced God as sovereign authority. If the state is a human construction, what are the sources of its evolution, maintenance, and termination? All are potentially present in the human individual and feed into society and state. Drawing on the two philosophers' notions, I've identified six wills residing in the individual human soul from whence life, labor, and society uh, uh, derived. The human will is a dynamo of mental energy that motivates the individual to action. These six comprise the set which constructs the state and changes its character. First is the will to live, the foundation of the five, of the other five. It results in actions of labor, production, and division of labor. Its primitive and continuing expression is in the search for food, water, and shelter. Animals and vegetation also exhibit the quest for survival and expansion of life, but largely without rationality. Second is the will to freedom. In its simplest form, it is the desire to be liberated from raw necessity and has been the source of human innovation, treating science, uh, creating science and technology. The will to live and the will to freedom can be considered as organic and subliminal among the human race as individuals seek to dominate the material environment. The will to power, number three, it tends to be limited to a minority who like alpha wolves have a strong will to live, seize a bigger share of resources and enforce social and political order. They transform or they, they transfer exclusive human attention from materialism to a constructed society and later to the state. Fourth is the will to comply. In Hobbes's metaphor of the Leviathan, men surrender their autonomy to a sovereign in return for the security he offers them. Their action is voluntary and creates the obligation to obey the laws. Their submission requires consistent, uh, constant affirmation and is, epitome, is epitomized in military discipline. Fifth is the will to transcend. Slow human evolution was not only in material and tribal progress, it was accompanied by speculation over life, death, and man's place in the universe and expanded into shamanism spirituality and philosophy. A search for meaning led humans to imagine other worlds in the afterlife and consider how they affect <clears throat> the present sensible life. 
Religion, philosophy, patriotism, and art have resulted from this will. And finally is the will to redirect. When a state has been established, circumstances change and policies must adapt. In the history of states, there have been men and women who recognize the need for change and they support room, uh, reform, usurpation, and rebellion. The constructed state is malleable and is affected by circumstances created by friends and enemies. These six wills, which my book describes in the historical context of the Korean state, locate state evolution as generated first in the human soul and mind, producing the actions which create, maintain, modify, and destroy the state. The state is our own creation, has been horribly destructive, and yet has brought greater knowledge, longevity, and order to the global population when directed to benefits for humanity. The state has become an intrinsic part of human existence and must be managed to achieve our highest potential and to restrain destructive proclivities. The main elements are indicated in the, the, this next slide. Um, I have four columns. Uh, the first column lists the, uh, the six wills I, I referred to. And the second column uh, reinforces the goals that we expect from the state. The, um, and the third column refers to the actions that are performed, motivated by the six wills and the fourth column indicates the, um, uh, the contributions and the, uh, how, how the, uh, these motivations produce stages of, of the state. China and the US represent distinctive states based on separate civilizations and their earlier solitudes have been replaced by close economic interaction for the present. At the state level, Friction and suspicion are returning. China sees America as a declining hegemon and the US is realizing that Chinese ambitions go beyond modernization and recognition, and recognition as partner in maintaining the status quo. Perhaps similar to Japan in the late 19th century and early 20th century, successful modernization by China will lead to dreams beyond sovereignty and onto global power. Conclusion. The present crisis may prove to be a historical point of change when American anti-Russian attitudes re-emerge and China's closer cooperation with Russia occurs at the expense of US-China relations. China and Russia see the US as declining uh, as a global hegemon. Third, the American self view as universal civilization is eroding. Uh, fourth, the uh, China may, may be seeking to replace the US as a global hegemon. And finally, civilizations and societies are organic responses to environmental challenges. And states are the products of human actions emanating from the individual's fundamental will to live. As to the future, there are at least three possibilities. First, the US will return to normal global leadership and reassert its interests and those of the non-communist states in the Pacific Rim, setting limits on Chinese ambitions. Second, America's new normal will consist of less assertiveness in the world and accept China as partner in setting global standards. Third, an aggressive and hyper-nationalist China could challenge a declining America and replace it as the dominant civilization and state in the world. Much depends on the viability of the Chinese economy and society as a unified force. A threat to order there might trigger a more assertive military as the broken economy in the 1930s, Japan led to aggression in China and military dominance. Americans must not forget that we live in a dangerous yet the most prosperous period in human history. As the, 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 uh, the old song erroneously proclaims, we are the world, we are in fact only a part of the world and should watch our neighbors carefully, especially those on the other side of the globe. The end.
All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Badesky, for that uh, very insightful and extremely timely talk. Uh, so I don't see open questions yet, so I want to remind the attendees that you can uh, write uh, in the Q&A to post a question. I wrote down several questions of my own along the way that I, I, I think I can just start with one of those while we, while we uh, wait for others to come along. Yeah. So my first question is uh, hopefully not too long and meandering. It's, it's about liberalism. Uh, as you mentioned, China is, you know, essentially has rejected liberalism at every stage, uh, whether it's traditionalist or communist. Um, the United States, well, there's certainly kind of a, an authoritarian tide that, that is rising, but I, I would still make an argument that the U.S. has maintained and even in some ways improved upon the, you know, realizing the ideal of liberalism. Is, is this something that's going to be... Uh, a problem for China in the future. I, I we've seen Russian illiberal military tactics lead to defeats, right? It, the lack of individual empowerment initiative, even in the military unit level, has been a problem. I think this extends to things like technology development and innovation. And, uh, you know, liberal markets, liberal government, in a lot of ways, are just objectively superior. I would argue. And I'm curious, do you think this is going to ultimately limit China's uh, ability to challenge the U.S. in the future? Or do you think the U.S. is going to become increasingly illiberal, perhaps? Uh, big question, like I said. Absolutely. Well, that, that was a, that's a loaded question. Uh, first of all, it depends <laughs> on what your, you know, what your definition of, of liberal, uh, liberalism is. And um, I, I consider myself to be a 1950s liberal, which means uh, limited government, primarily, it means it, it means tolerance, it means openness. Um, it, it means a, a belief in the efficacy of democracy. So, if uh, if I can use my own definition, um, I I, uh, I tend to see the U.S. as becoming more illiberal, in the sense that uh, there is more and more pressure on government to do more, whether it's healthcare, environment, uh, infrastructure. That is where uh, you can't have limited government and unlimited uh, activities in the, in the, in the same uh, state. So uh, in, that, in that sense, the, um, and, you know, just basing the idea of liberalism on limited government, I think the Chinese reject that out of hand. They see that governing a society, there's never been one as large as this in, the, in history, of 1.4 billion people. Um, how do you how do you manage a democratic country of that size? And um, plus the fact, as I mentioned, China has fourteen neighbors on its borders. We only have two, and uh, we we uh, seem to manage those okay. But uh, China has a, a has multicultural uh, neighbors, and uh, some are belligerent, some are and and don't forget that there's near war in the 1970s between the Soviet Union and China. So um, their society tends to be more militarized. It tends to be highly centralized. And the agency of its centralization is the Chinese Communist Party, which is not subject to any kind of accountability uh, or, or uh, elections uh, from, from outside citizens. So in, in a way, it is, it is the very antithesis of a liberal state. Um, and um, there are virtually no limits on, on uh, what the government can do. If the government decides that uh, one group of, um, one, one ethnic group must be transported to the other side of the country, it will be done without any lawyers, without any court cases, without any um, generation of, of, of opposing public opinion. So I think that, um, the, the uh, possibility of um, a liberal democracy in China is, uh, is not very great. We, we've seen China take over Hong Kong recently. And some of the first things that they've done is to, uh, is to exclude any dissidents or anybody who disagrees from political participation. Also, they are putting very strict really, um, limitations on the practice of religion in Hong Kong. So, um, you know, this is, this is the, the antithesis of, of toleration, of, um, of free speech, of uh, a free movement, and so forth. So 
I, I think we're going to be two. We're two different kinds of um, societies, and um, the twain shall never meet. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's it's a question that comes to mind a lot because. I don't know. I I feel like authoritarianism has sort of put liberalism on the ropes in recent years, and we just in recent you know events we've sort of seen that like liberals are are scrappy when it comes to it. Um, perhaps perhaps a little bit of a threat is what's needed to remind people of the benefits. But uh, it, it's uh, it's certainly an interesting question. Um, I I while we're still waiting in case other Q and A questions pop up. Okay, a, a chat has popped up. So um, I do have a question here for you. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. Oh, he's uh, so so. This is uh, Melissa uh, Jwarbe Pratt. Apologies if I mispronounced that. Is asking um, what do you feel is the primary reason socialism is being increasingly embraced in the United States, especially among millennials and Gen Z. Um, and then a follow-up question in regards to China's incre increasing global hegemony. Uh, do you feel the move towards socialism strengthens American power or will ultimately reduce American power? Okay, um, again, as, as I mentioned in, in my talk, socialism is, um, it's been tried. And um, in the, take the case of Sweden where it was tried and then um, it turned out to be uh, not very helpful in, on, in the economic sense. Plus the fact that, that uh, when people are taken care of too well, um, there, there is a loss of productivity. There is a loss of, of commitment. But I think the, the essential features, uh, let's, let's take the first one first. Um, why are young people turning to socialism? That's, uh, that's kind of peripheral to, to what I was talking about today, but just let me give you a, a rough and ready answer. And that is because I don't think that, um, I, we're getting further and further away from the actual experience of the type of socialism that was practiced in, in the Soviet Union. And we're forgetting that um, it uh, it depends on on uh, as Margaret Thatcher says it depends on taking other people's money that um, it it does not produce very much by itself it, uh, it gives benefits as long as the money holds up and um, socially the socialist economies have not proven to be very efficient because they are based on a highly developed state or a state that uh, takes over um, the uh, much of the economy. Um, I lived in Canada for 30 years and it's uh, more socialist than the United States. And um, something like 50% of my income was would go for taxes. And you find the same high rates of, of income taxes in, in other countries that, that practice uh, more socialism than, uh, than capitalism. So that that is one thing. The second thing is that uh, to make it work, there has to be a very strong and extensive uh, state apparatus, uh, a, an, uh, an expansive bureaucracy. Uh, in Britain, the, um, the, 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 uh, the health system is very um, bureaucratized and um, it has uh, been facing some, some severe problems. Government doesn't do things very well. There, there are some things that are necessary for government, defense, maybe uh, building roads, um, operating a postal service, but um, one has to realize that sometimes these things are, are done better in, in the private sector. Uh, getting back to uh, the younger generation, I'm afraid that they have um, in, uh, in, in school not been taught about the the realities of what happens when socialism is practiced and takes over much of, of um, society's operations. And, and um, so there's, there's a lack of historical uh, perspective there, I think. Um, and I think there's, a, there's an idealism. When, when I was young, when you were young, I mean, you're still young, but when you were younger, um, I'm sure you were idealistic. That, that, that's, that's the province, that's the province of, of being young. And as uh, you know, somebody said that uh, when you're young, you're going to be liberal and idealistic. And when you get older, you get to be more conservative when you have obligations, responsibilities and so forth. And so um, I think it's a, it's a phenomenon of youth. When I was uh, a student at Berkeley, I mean, socialism was 
you know, it seemed like a, a pretty good deal that um, capitalism meant you have to work hard, you have to, uh, uh, there's uh, uh, unequal division of wealth and so forth. And so socialism seemed like a good idea. But as you get older, you become more nuanced and you, your experience and um, uh, acquaintance with, with other societies is greater. And uh, you become a bit more um, informed on the consequences of different kinds of economic and political systems. Uh, what was the question about China, the second question? Uh, the related question was, is, uh, in regards to China's increasing global hegemony, uh, do you feel the, that move towards socialism strengthens American power or will ultimately reduce American power? Hmm, good question. Um, I think you made a, you made a remark by saying that, um, or you intimated that um, the war in the Ukraine is making us realize what we're up against. That uh, we, we we can't have this pie in the sky. We can't um, continue to assume that life will go on as as usual because there are some some. Uh, actors, some countries out there that uh, would like to do us evil, would, would like to uh, take us down a few a few notches, and um, the the problem with socialism, especially uh, in um, in a uh, conflict, is that they're not very good at organizing defenses. Uh, recall that. Um, when uh, Lenin and Stalin were in power in the Soviet Union, that um, when, when Germany attacked, well, uh, Stalin basically ab abandoned uh, the pure ideology of socialism, reinstituted uh, religion, reinstituted uh, patriotism, which was, which was the antithesis of, um, of socialist solidarity with, with the working class. And, um, so it doesn't work very well. It's, it's, uh, so I, I think that the more socialism we have in the, the United States, the less innovative we have, uh, the less innovative we, we become. Don't forget that the Chinese have acquired much of their technology through espionage, through joint ventures, through uh, students coming to the United States and taking the technology back uh, to China. There hasn't been much innovation. The same thing with the Soviet Union. It was not an innovative society. Um, there, there was no um, debate about science. I mean, you had a, you had a, a, a pretender like Lysenko who said that um, uh, he had discovered new laws of biology when, in fact, he had he had um, hidden his his actual experiments. So um, socialism generally is not very is not very competent in discovering new things. Whereas competition. Uh, even the dirty competition for profits has been tremendously stimulating to science and technology in uh, in the West. Thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions that have popped up. Uh, so uh, Kristen Cochran asks uh, two questions. So first, how does the war between Russia and Ukraine impact China? Does it strengthen or weaken China? And is there likely to be uh, an effect on the international system as a whole? Okay, yeah. Um, well, I, I, I touched on that uh, early in the paper, but let me expand a bit on that. Um, in, you know, let me, let me take another uh, example, COVID. Um, let's, let's give China the benefit of the doubt and say that it had escaped from the lab or maybe even from the wet market. But it gave not only China, but the rest of the world a chance to see what would happen in the case of a rapidly spreading um, virus that basically could cripple an entire society. Uh, you stand back and, and you take note of it and um, well, maybe you can redesign something or maybe you can change your, your everybody's gonna do, or everybody who has the ability will uh, be potentially a germ warfare practitioner. And so countries could step back and see what are the lessons from this COVID thing um, as, as an instrument of war. The same, the same analogy could be applied to uh, China, Ukraine, and Russia. Um, I think that 
uh, Russia was afraid that the Ukraine was going to be integrated into NATO or was going to become very pro-Western. The Ukraine is a region that has always been part of Russia, of the Russian empire or of the Soviet empire, and has been trying very hard to maintain its, its independence. Um, but from Putin's viewpoint, he was seeing a, a territorial threat that, um, and it was blocking him from uh, the Black Sea. The, the, the Russians have tremendous, have a great deal of interest in the Black Sea because their, their Navy operates there and, and they, could, they can go through the, um, uh, through the Dardanelles and, and, um, through, and through the Straits of Marmara into the Mediterranean Sea. So uh, with um, the Ukraine blocking Russian uh, passage into, into the Black Sea, potentially, uh, it was, uh, the Russians would see this as a, uh, as a threat to their, um, to their freedom of access. Okay, that was one thing. As far as China is concerned, the, uh, the Chinese not only are contemplating, but they are actively saying that, well, they've taken over Hong Kong. And so Taiwan is the next region that they lost in 1895 or that China lost in 1895 uh, and they want it back. So let's, so Xi Jinping is sitting up there in Beijing and watching the Russians and saying, well, let's see what happens when, when the Russians try to take back some territory they, they, they consider lost. Well, now they know, now the Chinese know. I think it'll give them pause. Um, and at least there will not be an attempt at, at um, uh, and in the near future, at, at a military takeover and they'll look for other means. But um, I think this, this kind of eliminated that uh, military uh, option for them. So that they, uh, and also the, the, the um, blowback against the Russians by the West has also pushed Putin uh, into a tighter embrace with China. Um, as I said, it's not going to be a second alliance as it was in 1950. Uh, there was a, it was a 30 year alliance they had at that time, but it will mean that there's going to be greater um, dependence of Russia on, on China. And um, so it is, it is uh, the beginning of, a, of the formation of a new bloc, unless Russia can be given something, perhaps neutralization of, of Ukraine. But I, but I think the tendency is that Russia is, is um, becoming more involved with, with China. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have two more questions. So uh, one, uh, uh, Galen Hanlon, again, apologies if I'm mispronouncing folks' names, uh, asks, are there, do you perceive any weaknesses in the Chinese model that perhaps politically or economically the West could exploit to, to weaken China's position? Hmm, very good. Um, well, the first thing is, um, you know, I mentioned the, the 2011 Obama uh, pivot to Asia. Well, that was not necessarily a good idea or a good decision because you don't tell an antagonist where you're going to emphasize and where you're not. I mean, basically, by pivoting to Asia, uh, he was he was indicating that um, uh, Europe is of, of lower priority, which may have gone into Putin's thinking that um, if the U.S. is going to concentrate on on Asia, well, then uh, Europe is is uh, is more vulnerable and, and maybe there's an opportunity there. Uh, so I think that one of the first things is to get thinking in the mode of geo strategy. I mean, you have to think of the big picture. You have to be a little more devious, I think. Uh, you don't lay out your cards as, you know, before Putin invaded uh, Ukraine, Biden stood up and said that, um, well, if it's only a small incursion, maybe we won't care. Uh, you don't you don't give away your your um, uh, your proposed strategies in advance. I think the U.S. has to act more like a uh, a disciplined hegemon. I mean, we the U.S. has the power, and many countries depend upon the U.S. being there. But uh, the U.S. cannot be totally open about what it's doing, even though there may be. I mean, there will be criticisms that we need to know more. Well, no, that isn't the way international politics works. So that's one thing. Secondly, um, 
we were all shocked by the hypersonic missiles that the Chinese and the Russians have been developing. We don't know, maybe they're jointly developing something like this. Um, and, and I think a lot of military planners were, were surprised at, at the rapid development of, of this weapon. So um, our intelligence operations have to be uh, improved. I think there has to be not only, um, not only electronic intelligence, but also boots on the ground, so to speak. Third, I think that um, there has to be constant improvement and um, investment in, in uh, defense weaponry training. I mean, uh, the last I heard, our naval fleet is at a size equal to that before World War II. Um, that is not very, that's not a very intimidating. I mean, maybe it was extravagant back in, uh, in, in, the, in the days of, um, of Reagan. Uh, maybe it was extravagant that the US goal was to be prepared for two and a half wars. Well, now we're basically prepared for one at most. And um, if, if we wanna be hegemonic, uh, we, we have to have greater maritime capability. I mean, much of the, uh, the post-Cold War prosperity was due to the, the free trade uh, in the Pacific region and uh, the, the opportunity for many of these developing countries to take advantage of, um, of what was available, especially the trade with the United States. But that depended upon uh, free passage in, in, in the waterways of the Pacific. So um, those, those three things I think would be important in standing up to China. And China's own, China has uh, feet of clay or at least one foot of clay. The uh, COVID is making a comeback even though they've had very severe lockdowns. So the Chinese are very vulnerable to diseases that uh, occur within their own, with their own borders. And secondly, the, uh, the Chinese economy is rather shaky, depending in large part upon foreign trade. And if anything happens that there are sanctions against China, uh, it will not merely mean economic collapse, but it would mean, um, I think, open rebellions in, in different parts of China. The, the, uh, the army would have to be sent in, and I think that um, it would be a, a very bad situation. So whether or not we want to ex exploit these things, um, that is up to uh, our, our government. But um, there, are, there are weaknesses, and um, they, they can be explored. Well, thank you. Actually, I think we have time for at least one more question. And your final point there nicely touches on what uh, one of the questions asks, which is, are the sanctions against Russia a strong enough signal to Beijing to prevent, uh, deter aggression against Taiwan? And, and I think uh, I, I would expand on this just a, a touch, given my own research, I'm quite interested on this, because I think that, as you noted, China, I think, took notice that the that the liberal world was more cooperative, more willing to come together to isolate aggressors. But, you know, Russia is a, a declining power. China is apparently still very much a growing power. It does Even if China believes the West will coordinate to impose sanctions, uh, and I think that there's even maybe still some question about that, but but even beyond that, does, does China uh, prefer to you know, to reappropriate Taiwan to a large enough degree that they maybe, do you think they might be willing to, to endure those sanction costs? I, th I think the, the sanctions would, would be devastating to China because um, the, the Chinese have been buying American bonds. They have been um, paying for our debt to, to, to a large extent. The, um, the banking system is, uh, the Chinese banking system it, while, while it's uh, very involved in the US, it is very flimsy in, in some, some ways within China itself. That is, um, there's been overbuilding. A, a lot of, a lot of uh, construction in China takes place in order to provide jobs for a huge, uh, potentially unemployed uh, sector of, of the population there. So uh, if, if the US were to stop buying Chinese products, our, well, the, the immediate thing would be that our own living costs would go up and China might have a counter boycott by not shipping things to us. But at the same time, without the inflow of cash, without the, uh, 
uh, the, the sales that take place, not only in the US, but in, in much of the world, um, there would be, uh, it, it would be a devastating effect on China. Uh, on the other hand, if China were to take over Taiwan, don't forget Taiwan makes what, about 90% of the computer chips in the mm -hmm. world. And that would, that would be devastating to us too. So we're, we're, we're in a situation, I think, that uh, before we conceive of uh, taking action against China, we have to understand what the costs would be. And, and so it would be better if we can all, um, uh, either through diplomacy or, or cultural exchanges or something, uh, in fact, improve our relations and, and not let the Ukraine event um, move us in, in a different direction. I think we're, we've been, we're moving in a, in a fairly good direction, but I think that uh, we, we have a certain momentum. And I think China had a, a certain momentum and inertia that you found the right way to handle these things. So let's keep doing it. Well, the circumstances are changing and we have to readapt. Uh, you know, personally, I do not have a great deal of faith in the current administration, nor in the previous administration. But um, we have to do better. And I think we have to urge the Chinese to, to also be more cooperative and understand our problems, and we have to understand their problems. Thank you. Well, we have one more question. I think we, we have time for this. Um, it, it kind of returns to this, this I guess, more philosophical uh, and definitional issues of what, you know, what is liberalism, capitalism, socialism. Um, uh, uh, is a uh, participant asks, how can we better integrate well-being and quality of living uh, by finding maybe a happy medium between capitalism and socialism? I think this is relevant, at least tangentially, because you know, the U.S. system uh, faces a lot of, of discontent, particularly among young people who are you know, finding it challenging to you know, afford health care and things like that. Um, I would often describe like Canada and, and, and Europe as, as Rawlsian liberal as opposed to socialist. I could think, again, that's just as a quibble on definitions. But do you think that, uh, you know, a more laissez-faire approach could actually backfire and undermine the U.S. system, which would make us less able to compete with China to try to tie it a little bit back more into the, to the theme? Well, you know, there are, there are places where laissez-faire seems to work rather well. And as long as we're innovative, as long as um, you know, entrepreneurs have the freedom to try new things, I think um, we can adapt much better than if we say that, well, the government is most qualified, the, the state should decide on, on these things because it represents all of society, that uh, you know, it's about um, trash pickup. Do you have, do you have does the private sector or, or the, the public sector do it best? Well, let's try a little bit of both and see, see who su succeeds. I think in, in that way, we already have a kind of mixed system. I think uh, a number of years ago, the American Communist Party said that uh, half of their goals have been achieved in the United States. We have, we have um, Social Security, we have all these other things. And uh, so in a way, there, there has been a fusion of socialist and, cap and capitalist ideas. But it's because we're an open system. Uh, China had a, a kind of celebration of openness in the 1980s. Um, you had some private sectors and there were a number of, of airline companies that were competing. There were uh, other companies competing and whoever came up best. But now they, they, they decided on one system and it has to be, uh, uh, it has to be in favor of the state. Uh, so they're taking away some of this innovation. But I think as long as the United States maintains this uh, this dialectic, if you will, between socialism and capitalism, I think we will continue to be, we will continue to be adaptive and um, innovative. Well, fantastic, thank you. Uh, well, that takes us to 75 minutes, which I believe was our allotted time. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank Dr. Badesky one more time and thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, I found this to be a very enlightening uh, presentation and Q&A. Uh, and thank you all. I hope you'll join us again in the future for, for more of our colloquia. Thank you very much, Timothy. Thank you.